Yeah, and I think I have it set up so everybody can, so you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, sure. So, oh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today we have Dr. Scott Van and Dr. Fairberg that are here to help us understand the best practices um, for teaching online and really trying to increase engagement with our students. The session is being recorded. If you don't have a question at the time, if you could mute yourself, um, that would be good. And if you do have a question, feel free or I can moderate that in the, the chat. So um, Scott and Fair, thank you very much and I'll let you begin. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay and see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for attending today. Um, we also have on the call with us Dr. Farrah Bird. Um, she's one of our uh, structural designers with the uh, Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Uh, so what we do at the University of Memphis is that we help faculty uh, develop quality courses uh, three, for U of M Global, as well as uh, we also assist faculty with on-ground courses as well. Uh, so my name is Scott Mann. I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Learning here at the University of Memphis. I oversee our UM3D team, which we handle, again, all the design, development, and delivery, really, of all of our courses um, here at the University of Memphis. So hopefully today we can provide you some good best practices and introduce you to some tools uh, in the courseware that can help um, engage your students and also make your teaching job just a little bit easier as we all transition to this online learning due to our current health crisis. So um, we just want to also talk about some upcoming events uh, that we have through our department as well. Uh, we've been hosting what we call our Ignite series. We just wrapped one up uh, two weeks ago. Um, all of these events are always recorded, so they're always available on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Um, so feel free to check that out. And in chat, um, Fair, if you wouldn't mind just to drop in our UN3D um, event calendar, you can also find those on there uh, in chat. Um, and then as we're going through today too, feel free to ask any questions uh, through chat. We're going to pause here in a few of the segments to take questions um, and I will monitor chat. Um, and while I'm presenting, Fair will be monitoring. And then while Fair is presenting, I'll be monitoring chat. So uh, definitely feel free to engage with us there. So our two upcoming events to talk about really quick is uh, taking your course to the next level gamification. Uh, this is a, a session that um, Barrett Schwartz on our team and myself will be leading. Uh, gamification is, is a real passion of mine. It's what I did my uh, doctoral research in. And then we have a lot of tools that are underutilized uh, in any courseware uh, that also kind of helps drive engagement. We'll talk uh, briefly about it in our presentation today. Uh, but we'll go really in uh, detail with it in our gamification presentation on the 17th. Uh, we also polled faculty uh, over the spring that attended a lot of our events to try to see times that fit best for everybody's schedule. Um, and we found that late afternoons and some faculty even did evening was better for them. Uh, so we're kind of structuring different timing and trying to see you know, uh, what time is best. So for this next session, it's going to be at 7 p.m. Uh, but feel free to register um, and then we'll also will uh, send you the recording if you're not available to attend. And then the uh, one we got in October is the triple threat uh, using templates to promote uh, consistency, accessibility, and markability of your courses. Um, and there's some really great ways to use HTML templates in your course to uh, develop a brand you know, through your college, but as well as meeting accessibility standards that uh, are really important uh, here at the University of Memphis. Also want to talk just briefly about OLC. This is a resource um, that uh, through U of M Global, we have purchased a subscription for the entire university. Um, you can go to OLC's website. There's a register button at the top right corner. Uh, if you register for account, just use your memphis.edu address. Um, this is available to full-time, part-time adjuncts. As long as you have a University of Memphis email address, you can have access to a wealth of professional development sources um, for online teaching as well as teaching in general. Uh, so we definitely recommend checking them out. Um, they have a lot of great webinars that, uh, that they do quite a bit and ones that are already been recorded. Um, they got a lot of PDFs um, for just kind of best practices, research articles, all that good stuff. So I'd like to kind of just um, always mention that in our presentations. That's a great resource for faculty to check out. Um, and then here's just some information with how to access it. Um, after this presentation, I'll be happy to um, Dr. Zanka, send this presentation over to you and you can feel free to share it with, with everyone in the slide deck and I'll have more information about how to access that uh, OLC account. Thank you very much. Of course, yeah. And so uh, some of the webinars that uh, the team kind of found that's upcoming that 
um, may be applicable to our conversation right now that um, you know, go a little bit more in depth. Uh, effective uh, facilitation of online discussions with students and students engaged in transition to online learning. Uh, so feel free to check out those webinars as well. So uh, when we're doing these, especially our summer institute, we did these, uh, a lot of these with up to 300 participants. So we always kind of remind everybody, we've, we've all done a lot of these Zoom meetings now for a while, but um, you know, if you want to turn your camera off, that's totally fine. You'll, you'll probably notice when um, I'm not presenting, my camera will go off and I mean, Farrah's got hers off now. That's just to kind of help us on bandwidth. Um, um, and then if you don't mind to keep your microphone muted till we get to the questions and answer, that would be, that would be helpful for us. Uh, and feel free to use the chat as we go. Um, you know, like I said, while I'm presenting, Fair is monitoring chat, um, and then I'll be monitoring chat for her while she's presenting. And so um, we have different segments throughout the presentation. We'll stop for questions. So feel free to um, you know, send questions as we go through. So Fair, I think this is where I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, and I can go ahead and drive. I, I'm sorry, I should ask this before we got started. Is it you want yep. to share the screen fair or you want me to just drive? Online? You just drive, go right ahead. That is totally fine. Um, so yeah, so thanks so much, Scott. Um, so as far as our goal of school go for today, um, and I really think we all have pretty good understanding of where our students are coming from in the context of the pandemic and in the context of trauma-informed teaching and um, all these practices that have evolved out of um, all of the kind of the current context we're working within. Um, and we also wanted to spend some time discussing approaches for monitoring engagement, um, increasing social interaction, um, avoiding burnout, which are all um, kind of key themes and challenges that arise when it comes to um, student engagement. And then lastly, we wanted to make sure that um, you at least feel equipped to be able to use specific tools for student engagement like uh, release conditions or intelligent agents or awards or virtual classroom and Scott's going to be talking about that um, a little while later as well. So if you look back in 2019 before the shift to um, online remote instruction for everyone um, in the spring about 40 something percent of the students were not taking any online classes at all. So as you know, um, we have a pretty good population of students who at one point in time um, probably weren't ready um, at that time to make the shift to online. Um, and when they're not ready, they become disengaged, they become overwhelmed. Um, they're not necessarily, um, in some cases, coming to the table with a skill set um, or maybe not even the motivation that they need to self-regulate in the way that online learning requires. So something that we all know, but it's kind of good to see the numbers that we have a, a pre pretty good percentage of students who more than likely have um, maybe started to make the shift a little bit better. Now that we're not in the spring, we're in the fall, they've had some time to adjust. Um, but still, so we probably still have quite a few students who are in the mindset of, um, I'm just not used to this, right? Um, so this is something we already know about our students. We know that we're seeing students who are feeling overwhelmed, um, not only by online learning, but students who are also overwhelmed by the current climate. Um, so I guess the main idea is that there are things that we can do about it that are rather simple um, and easy to do that can make a big difference for our students. Um, so if you look here at just some kind of three main ideas. So we know that in general students, when it comes to online learning, they want to feel connected. Uh, with their classmates. They want to feel connected with their professors. Um, in addition, they want to be a part of this whole college experience. So, um, I mean, theoretically, they just, they don't want to miss out, right? So these are the conversations we're hearing. This is what we're hearing from faculty and from students that they just want to feel like they're a part of something that's really important to them. And if you look more closely at what students feel like they need from us as instructors, as educators, they need us to balance structure with flexibility, um, which can be challenging. Um, so you can be too structured, right? And you can be too flexible. Um, so really just trying to maintain a balance between the two. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that, you know, students are looking for a meaning, you know, meaningful learning opportunities. Um, and so that's true whether you're teaching an on-ground course or hybrid or online. Um, and then lastly, the obvious factor here um, is that they need to be engaged, um, meaning they are being brought into um, the learning experience instead of disseminating information or pushing content out to them, which sometimes tends to take place or is more likely to take place um, in the online environment. So we had a couple of questions. We'd love to hear from you in the chat um, from your perspective. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. We're just looking for like your point of view. What are the benefits of teaching and learning online? Um, same goes with like remote classes, synchronous, asynchronous. From your perspective, what are the benefits? And 
and feel free. We got a, we kind of got a small group, so feel free to you know unmute yourself if you would rather talk than chat yep. as well. Absolutely. Uh, I'll kind of kick us off fair just to kind of get the conversation going. Um, you know, I, I thought about it last night at 1.30 in the morning as I was responding to discussions um, in my own courses that I'm teaching. I like the flexibility of the timing of it. So um, I've done face-to-face -face as well as online. Um, I much prefer online just for the flexibility. Uh, but, you know, events like last night when I had like a sick kid and I'm up taking care of him and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I was like, you know what, I want to work on some grading. It's kind of hard to do when you're you know, teaching that face-to-face, -face, obviously. So personally for flexibility, I'm also seeing a lot of chats come in saying the same. Flexibility, convenience for students managing work and home lives. Um, so I think that's a, you know probably the most common that we hear too with the own 3D is from the perspective of the, the benefit of teaching online. Yeah, and I thought you make it, made a good point, Scott. It's not just about flexibility for the students, but it, for us as instructors, <laughs> there's yes. a lot of benefits um, to teaching online, um, especially when it comes to that flexibility. So that looks like that's kind of a key theme here too. So um, anyone else? Okay, so the next question is um, the, the flip side of that. Um, again, from your perspective, no, no right or wrong answer. Um, what would you say are the challenges of teaching and learning online? And again, you can speak up or you can post it in the chat. Either way is fine. Hey, this is Eli. Um, I think one of, the main, one of the challenges that I see and that I've perceived is that um, when you talked about that connection between faculty and students and peers, I think that can be a challenge in an online setting to be able to establish that connection. Um, I, I mean, it's possible, but it's still not as easy as if you're in person in a class setting where you can have a nice discussion, you can talk to each other, you can see each other, you've got body language to go off of. So a connection can be kind of tricky on an online setting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, sometimes it doesn't feel like it happens as easily. You almost have to kind of proactively um, like build in pieces to, to help facilitate that. So yeah, absolutely. Same building a community, um, students and faculty both preferring in-person human interaction. Absolutely. Technology and connectivity issues. I think that's probably one of the most underreported, if I can jump in there real quick, fair, with yeah. technology issues, especially with our area of the country. Um, you know, we had a survey that went out the entire, I don't think the data has been released yet, but IT uh, sent out a survey about students' access to technology, um, seeing some of the preliminary results um, of that. And there was a large amount of students who don't have internet access at home or identified as not having a laptop or access to a, you know, a PC. The large majority of our students are connecting from mobile devices, you know, which is, um, you know, one of the importance of that we like to you know, push for using HTML templates for making it more mobile friendly. But I think that's one thing sometimes we forget too, is that, um, you know, especially for the, the area that we service, uh, there's not a, a, a large access to high speed internet and um, the technology you know, components required for online learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's absolutely, and it's, I think it's even more challenging because it feels out of our reach, right? It, because it's not really related to the design of the course or my instruction. I mean, there's flexibility, right? But then there's the technology piece of that that's, you know, it is what it is. And there's other, other things that are happening outside of the environment of the course that are um, maybe hindering um, their access to learning. I had a student who um, who had, you know, reached out to me to let me know that um, in the middle of all this, they would have worked in the library and used the internet there, but um, they didn't feel comfortable with it, right, because of the current, the current climate. Um, so I had to kind of work with them and be flexible with them. Um, it's all really good feedback. Um, and so <clears throat> kind of moving in and as a segue into our conversation today, um, I think, you know, some of the challenges that we see or that we hear when we're talking with faculty, tend to kind of fall under, it's not all of these, I think there's just a whole spectrum of opportunities we have uh, when it comes to engagement. And I remember when we were asked to talk about this, we were thinking, I know I was thinking, well, how are we gonna talk about engagement in an hour? <laughs> we could talk about that all day, all week, right? There's just so many facets um, to that. But some of the themes that tend to, to crop up in conversations from what we hear and, and talking with other faculty, um, tend to lean toward monitoring engagement, 
Um, so like, how do I know if my students are engaged? Um, I can't, I think somebody kind of said, spoke to that. I can't see my students. So, you know, how do I know they're paying attention? Um, how do I know they're learning and understanding? How do I know they're um, actually watching the videos <laughs> I have in my course? So these are things that are some, uh, that sometimes come up when talking about engagement. Um, social interaction is also a key piece. Um, if you just think about your own experience as educators or as instructors, I mean, just for all of us, I mean, we ourselves have felt in all this change and in the shift of our environment to more remote work. I mean, we have all felt that lack of social engagement and connectedness in some ways. Um, so our students are experiencing the same thing um, and probably more so because that social aspect of learning is something that they really do seek and pursue as a part of their whole learning experience. And the last thing, but not the only thing that tends to be a challenge is um, avoiding burnout. So what can we do to help keep students from fizzling out um, or just feeling fatigued when it comes to learning? And again, um, some of that may come from external factors that have nothing to do with the learning experience. But uh, because we are dealing with human beings, we have to deal with that too and figure out how do we help them navigate learning uh, while also balancing that with um, other aspects of their lives. Um, and so anyway, so we have... Um, strategies like early intervention and things of that nature, but there are definitely some other things that we can do in the online environment that are um, very simple and practical to help us um, avoid burnout too. So, um, so one thing that I would recommend to help with monitoring engagement um, and also um, helping to keep students engaged would be to um, incorporate student feedback. So I'm not just talking about, you know, the evaluations at the end of the semester. That's also a great holistic way um, to get feedback on the course, um, but also looking for ways to get feedback while the course is in session or feedback in ways that allow you to see um, a little more organically how students are moving along. Um, so a few ways to do this would be one, you could use the surveys tool in eCourseWare or something like Microsoft Forms um, and include a temperature check in your course to have students check in with you. Um, it could be informal or you can just formalize it as a part of your course to ask them on a regular basis, how are you doing? Um, or even more specifically ask them, you know, what's going well for you in this course? What's not going well? What can I help you with? And just kind of prompt them to interact with you and reach out to you um, because there will always be those students who are maybe disinclined to do that on their own and you may have to kind of prompt them um, to reach out with their questions. Um, and this is also especially helpful in courses that are more asynchronous in nature because we don't always have those opportunities. And I think somebody mentioned this earlier. We don't always have those opportunities to observe body language and their facial expressions to know if they appear to be confused, right? Or just outright tired or bored even. Um, so including those prompts can, can definitely be helpful. Also, when it comes to monitoring and tracking engagement, um, you can use tools like Zoom or Virtual Classroom um, to view total seat time um, or the total time um, in the meeting. Um, and so it's useful data if you want a general idea on um, how much time um, students might be spending in your virtual classroom. Um, so it's definitely useful data to be aware of. You may already be, but if not, um, just know that data is there. Um, however, I would encourage you to use that data with some caution because um, we really don't have a way of knowing for sure exactly what that data means. Um, or it's not really a measurement of engagement. Um, it's more a measurement of how much time they are for how long they had a meeting running without logging out. Um, so it's really up to you how you use that information and it's um, far better to have that information than none at all. Um, but just keep in mind that it's not necessarily a measurement of interaction. So I'm seeing some questions coming in on surveys. The surveys taken in eCourseWare. Oh yes, so the surveys tool. Um, so there's a surveys tool in eCourseWare that you can use um, just like you create quizzes. So when you pull up that drop down list where you create a quiz, um, there's a surveys option. And basically it's, it's very similar to creating a quiz in eCourseWare. It's just that um, it has more of a survey function and you can make it anonymous as well. So, so um, Next, as far as monitoring engagement, you can view time spent on content in eCourseWare. Um, a lot of you are probably already familiar with this, um, but if not, there's a tool called Class Progress um, that you can use to view how much time students are spending on specific pieces of content in a course. Uh, and this is one that I use quite frequently because um, most of the online courses I facilitated have been asynchronous, so courses where students are moving at their own pace, and so it helps me to chase after students who are uh, maybe a little disinclined um, to participate or submit assignments correctly or on time. Um, and certainly I'm not saying this is an opportunity to reach out and say, hey, you know, I have my eyes on you, um, but it is an opportunity to ask, um, how's everything coming along? Have you had a chance to watch that video or read that article? 
um, when I know they really haven't, <laughs> but I'm keeping them at the center of their learning and um, guiding them in the right direction, knowing where the deficits are. Um, okay. So, go course. ahead. I'm sorry, Fair. So that's one of the tools too that we'll, if, if time allows, we'll pull up at the end and just kind of show you what that looks like. Uh, because I think it is a good way as, as Fair talked about to kind of check on the engagement within the course. Yep, absolutely. Um, so yeah, social interaction tends to be something that is by default um, sometimes lacking in the online environment if we don't intentionally create those opportunities. So I'll just share with you just a few practical, simple, quick and easy ways um, to do that. Uh, one way which some of you probably are already doing is to create group breakouts um, and you can do this through either virtual classroom or zoom. This is a great way to quickly and easily get students interacting with each other and working together in real time. So if you're not using group breakouts, I would definitely encourage you to at least kick the tires on that. Maybe try that out um, one week or with one module um, to see how that goes. Um, so that's one way that you can can facilitate that. Another way to help students interact and connect, um, especially on things like group projects, and this is not a new tool or new platform, um, but it's to allow them opportunities to collaborate using the online version of uh, Microsoft Office tools or Microsoft 365. So it's pretty much like Google Docs. I think um, a lot of you are in the College of Education or using Google Docs already, so it pretty much has a, a similar function. Um, and so this allows your students to work in real time. Um, and like I said, this isn't really a new solution or new tool um, for us, but it is one that seems to be underutilized in some cases. Um, and it's probably the closest product we have at the university um, to a productivity tool that allows for real time collaboration. Um, and then the last recommendation here is to try to um, keep the dialogue going as much as possible and not reserve it for just class time or just the discussion board. Um, the discussion board is a great tool for structured dialogue or um, conversations that are assessed and monitored. However, there are additional ways to create that social presence. Um, Microsoft Teams, we're not going to go over like the how to of using the tool. It's pretty intuitive if you, if you haven't used it yet. Um, but my, if you want to reach out, we can send you some resources from ITS on that too. Um, Microsoft Teams is a great way to do that um, and create a little bit more of a social presence because it'll, it allows you to have that experience that it's, it's somewhat similar to a social media type of application. Um, so when students post or you post, you can get notifications on your phone. Um, you can react to each other's posts. You can add attachments and so forth. Um, and so, um, and certainly if you are using Microsoft Teams in your classes this semester, since I think they just turned it on this fall, um, we'd love to hear from you and get some feedback um, since we are kind of in an exploration stage with this product. But um, I think Microsoft Teams is very promising um, when it comes to bringing more of a, a learning community element into our courses. And then the last thing that I wanted to cover really quickly is on avoiding burnout. Um, so again, like we've uh, talked about before. It's another common challenge we're all facing. Um, we all have a lot going on. Um, this year has been a lot for everyone and it's been a lot for our students. Um, so it's just a few easy ways to um, help avoid burnout in your online courses. Um, one way is to um, find ways to share the goals with your students and share that space um, to try to create somewhat of a like a two-dimensional goal um, that not only says what your expectations are, uh, but then also invite students to articulate those goals as well. Um, and this is a great way to keep students connected in the course um, and then they can see you're making that connection with them. Um, so you can do this in a couple of ways. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do it, just a couple of examples. Um, you can just ask them before class, have them fill out a form or send you an email and just include it as a part of your lecture. Um, another way I was thinking about is you can do this more kind of on the fly with your remote courses with a simple virtual whiteboard and invite students to share with you um, what they would like to cover in class that day. Um, so that doesn't mean that you simply cover other, everything the students ask for, um, but they will at least see you meeting them halfway to pull them into the learning experience. Um, and then the next thing is something I, I think sometimes we forget to do with remote courses because, um, you know, we have an agenda, we have um, certain things to cover, um, you know, we have a limited amount of time. Um, and just to make sure we're building into that, you know, time to, to pause, um, time to think, um, and um, time to just ask the students, how are you? Um, and you can do that in an open-ended way um, or to be more inclusive of the more shy students, um, you could use an anonymous poll. Um, this is just one example, ask them on a scale of one to five, one being anxious, five being really excited uh, or satisfied. Um, tell me how you're doing right now. 
Um, and questions like that are going to give you really powerful information about your students because then you can go into that conversation um, and into that lecture really feeling like you know your students um, and you know what they're bringing uh, to your class with them. Um, another way to help avoid burnout is to really try to personalize the experience as much as possible. I think um, this isn't related to choice, but I think Scott might, um, if we have time, might be able to cover intelligent agents, which is one great way to do that. Um, but another way to help avoid burnout is try to um, personalize the experience as much as possible. So what we're talking about here is differentiation, right? Giving students choices and options, um, giving them alternative ways of doing things and allowing them to be in the driver's seat as much as possible. Um, so if the objective is for students to um, compare and contrast something, is there one way or multiple ways to go about this? Can they talk about it? Can they show you? Can they draw it? Um, so try to give students options when you can, um, and this really empowers them to feel like um, or know that they are in control of their learning. And the last one is, I know this is a little bit rapid fire, so thanks for staying with me on this. Um, and feel free to ask questions too in the chat. Um, the last one is to try to create a simple experience for your students. And I say simple with caution because I'm not talking about academic content or rigor. Um, what I'm saying is to give yourself permission to reframe um, the learning experience and communication so students find simplicity and consistency in that interaction. So you really don't want students devoting valuable cognitive real estate to interactions um, with content that might be overly complex or not chunked and so forth. So definitely something to think about is to try to keep it simple. And again, we're not talking about rigor. We're talking about just the way in which students interact with the course materials or the way they interact with you. So I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it over to Scott. And he's going to talk a little bit more about reducing cognitive load and then some of the tools available to you uh, to help you increase engagement. Thanks, Fair. Appreciate that. Um, and I've been uh, sending some stuff through chat. Um, I also went ahead and just I made a Bitly link because the link for the uh, slide deck was really long. So uh, feel free to check chat. Uh, we can also send it via email afterwards as well. But there is a link to the uh, presentation. Um, made a, a copy of the presentation, share with everybody, as well as I shared some resources uh, about Teams that Fair was talking about earlier. So all that is uh, over in chat. So uh, FAIR provided some great um, resources to consider, some, some techniques and tools. Uh, so we want to highlight just a few. Uh, again, we can, we can make this a, a six-hour workshop and still not cover everything at our disposal. Uh, but we kind of want to pick on those low-hanging fruits, the ones that we feel like um, require the less tech savviness, if you will, to, to use and are the ones that are, you, know, you automatically have available to you right out of the box any courseware. Uh, so with teaching online, one thing that we, we really want to try to do um, is reduce cognitive load as much as possible. Uh, we put this design purposely in a lot of the professional development courses that we've created through uh, UM3D for faculty, uh, most recently the Summer Institute. Um, we've also used this technique in a lot of our uh, uh, corporate partnerships um, with FedEx and now Nike to do um, really purposeful design on reducing cognitive load as much as possible and putting content into small chunks. Um, I won't read through all the text on this slide. Again, we shared it with you, so it's got some good information. Uh, but basically, it's our working memory that we're trying to um, reduce so that they can have the most um, access to all the learning materials as much as possible within your course. Uh, and by content chunking, you're not, a student's not logging in and seeing 96 things to complete within the course. Uh, if you took our Summer Institute, uh, I see several of the names on the list here are very familiar and are participants in the Summer Institute course. Um, if you logged in on day one, you would have saw 197 items. Um, and I know if I logged in to a professional development workshop and saw 197, I would probably just log back out and say, I'll do this another time. Um, but we purposely release 10 at a time or at least eight at a time. We kept them really small chunks. Um, and that way, when you're going through, you're completing one module, it's unlocking the next, you're unlocking the next. And before you know it, you've completed 197 items. Um, and many of the faculty, I think our average time fair, uh, looking back on it, you know, a lot of our faculty completed within a week, uh, which is, you know, you're, they devote a lot of time to get it done in a week. Uh, but the average was about a week to, to 10 days. Um, and we, they were, faculty were able to do that because we use as content chunking. So it's just breaking content into shorter bite-sized pieces. Uh, it's more manageable and easier to remember. Um, I always like to kind of just use the analogy of like, 
think about chapters in a book. You know, we were all teaching from, uh, most of us are teaching from textbooks. Um, you know, they're all purposely designed into smaller chapters. That way you can, students can get the information uh, and, and settings. Uh, so we also want to do the same with our course content. Uh, so we have tools uh, right outside the box that are available for you, and they're called release conditions. Uh, this allows content to be released when a certain piece of criteria is met. Uh, if we've got any IT nerds amongst us, um, like myself, we like to convert those as if-then statements. Uh, it's very common in computer programming language. Uh, but in this case, just think about the conditions met, it releases the, the content. Um, here's just a, a, one example of many that you can do within the course. Um, in order for them to get to week one in this example, they have to take a syllabus quiz. Uh, syllabus quiz is not required for you in global courses, but we do encourage it. Uh, it's one way for, to verify that students are reading your syllabus. Um, what I like to do in some of the courses that I teach is just find two or three things that really stand out in the course. One I like to do is when is the final exam? Uh, maybe when is the midterm? Um, you know, what is the requirements for posting in the discussion board? Or what type of file format is required for the final essay? Um, so those are just kind of key pieces of information that they have to read your syllabus to make sure that they get. And so in this case, the release condition is week one doesn't come available until they complete the syllabus quiz. Then once that's available, the next module unlocks. And you'll notice it may be a little hard to see here in the presentation, but table of contents shows 11. Um, and so if you didn't use release conditions, the table of contents number is going to show all files in the course. Um, again, going back to Summer Institute, that would be 197 if we didn't have release conditions. But because release conditions are applied, you're going to see a smaller number like 11 in this example. Um, and then you'll see here where you, know, you can add, again, same place that you would add dates. Um, and a lot of our faculty are using dates. And that's a great way for content chunking too. So if you want to um, set dates on, you can do that. Um, I personally uh, like to use more of the release conditions, allow students to progress at their own rate and not stop students from progressing. Uh, but there's certain situations where you have to, um, especially if you're in a very structured class or maybe they're having to take content that's part of some type of national accreditation or some type of testing schedule. You may not want them working ahead uh, too far, so the dates would be a great way to also do content chunking. And you'll see here, these, these, all these screenshots are in the, uh, the webinar link uh, for the slide deck, but you would just hit create here and you get this whole list of, and it's the really, the, the possibilities are, are, are really kind of endless, um, but you got release conditions based on discussion post, on if the discussion was not posted, on grades, on a quiz, um, on Dropbox submissions, on survey attempts. I mean, you can, any tool, any courseware that's available to you, you have a release condition for it. Uh, the ones that we just want to highlight just for simplicity, you know, quizzes are really easy because you can put a, a, a less than or equal to grade or a greater than or equal to grade on a release condition. Um, so for instance, in our Summer Institute, 80% uh, was a required threshold for most of our knowledge checks. So you had to complete 80% before you got to the next court or to the next module. Um, we also allowed unlimited attempts. Um, so that may not be um, the best structure for you in your course. Uh, but if you did you know, want to have it tied to a quiz, just know that you do have the ability to tie it to a grade item or a score on the quiz, as well as attempts as well. Um, one thing that you can also do here, and you can see the, the condition details, you can tie multiple conditions. So it doesn't have to be just one. Uh, once you tie multiple, it'll come up and have all conditions are met, or it will be any condition is met. And so if you want to be able to tie, um, in this case, if week one was a be a lot, maybe you want them to require to introduce themselves in the discussion forum. So they'll have to post a discussion forum, the introduction forum, and they'll have to uh, make 100% on the syllabus quiz. So just some examples of ways that you can uh, use those release conditions. And then once you've set it all up, this is what uh, shows uh, for that condition. Um, you also have the same thing to do with topics in your course. So if you had a particular uh, survey, for instance, that you want to lock until a certain condition is met, you can click the arrow beside that survey or, or that piece of content. Uh, these steps are going to be the same for really anything in the courseware, but we're just highlighting a survey here. And then when you click that arrow beside that piece of information, you'll get the add um, 
dates and restrictions area. And so the same thing that applies as it did in the previous screenshots, you have the ability to apply the release conditions. Uh, in this case, maybe you want them to complete the survey once they've completed everything within the, that module. So maybe the release condition here would be, um, well, here's some examples. They visited the content and it lists each piece of content they visited. So we want to get students feedback on all the content. So we want to make sure that they viewed all the content. Now, one thing with, with um, eCourseWare is it's, they, cleave, um, they count visit as a click. And so with the user progress tool, you're able to see how long they spend on average on that click. But a student could essentially just click each piece of information and then proceed to the next. Um, but at least you are requiring them to access it. Um, there, unfortunately, it's not a way to require them. They spend X amount of time on it, but you can put that they have to at least visit it before they can proceed. Um, another way that I like to use release conditions in the course too is on news items. If I'm reminding a student about a uh, particular activity that's coming up or um, reminding them about the final exam or posting information about grades, you can tie release conditions um, to news as well. So you can have a release based on availability, which is kind of the most uh, basic uh, release is just putting a date on it and it ends after a certain date. But you also can have a release based on a condition. Um, and so you can have to where they don't get a reminder about um, a Dropbox assignment until they complete the quiz because in your course, they can't be successful in that Dropbox assignment until they've completed you know, X uh, required quiz. And so that's how you would do that there. Same steps that we had before. Um, and the great thing about the courseware here is uh, no matter if you're tying it to news, quizzes, Dropbox, content, um, the UI looks the exact same. And so you have the attach existing or create and attach. Uh, the attach existing would just be if you've already created that release condition elsewhere, you can tie up to that piece of content as well. So that was a lot of information in a short period of time about release conditions. I'm gonna pause here for questions. Um, so feel free to chat or um, unmute your mic. Scott, one of the things when I've done on online instruction. I've had more, you know, students will have life experiences that keep them from getting something when I've used dates as the restriction. And it's created more, it's taken more work for me to correct the, the date and get something opened up for people. I like the idea of um, using conditions other than dates. It just seems like that way I'm not tying them to a certain day and a certain time if they have a car accident, I don't have to go back in, reopen it. Right. And work through all that. No, that's a great use case for it. Um, I found that in my own class. I teach uh, intro to system analysis and design is one of the courses I teach. And they're required to take certain amount of chapter quizzes. And the chapter quizzes are really kind of textbook, but there's no reason they can't work ahead um, in that particular course. Um, and there's no reason why like, if they get behind they could take two quizzes the next week. Um, sure. So I, I found that the student grades went up last semester when I did that. Um, I mainly did it with COVID um, because I got so many emails, uh, like most faculty, that XYZ happened, I couldn't do it. So I just removed all dates. I put yeah. end dates because the end of the course still has to be met. But I just put release conditions in there. Too. So you, have, you couldn't take quiz two and do quiz one, you could progress at your own pace. Um, and I noticed that, you know, a good amount of uh, grade point average going up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. But we'll still be monitoring chat as it goes. If you think anything, feel free to drop it in um, chat. Uh, I'll be looking, kind of keep an eye on it, and so it's fair as we go through here. Um, so another thing we can kind of talk about is personalizing content. Again, another kind of, um, I like to think of a, a, a low-tech um, a tool that you can use that doesn't require a lot of um, experience is intelligent agents. This makes your job or your life so much easier, I think, um, especially for teaching large classes. Um, with our FedEx partnership, we have 300 students per course, and we have one facilitator that manages that entire course. Um, and we usually tell that is like, how in the world are you able to do 300? It's because we use tools like release conditions and intelligent agents, uh, because it allows for a lot of automation that happened behind the scenes, uh, kind of artificial intelligence, if you will. Um, so just like with the release conditions, you can tie intelligent agents to a release. 
Um, and here's some just some, some uh, brief examples. There's there's really a lot of them, but uh, the ones that we kind of like to, to highlight are sending an automated welcome message. So as soon as students log into your course, um, let's say that that release condition is taking a syllabus quiz. Now you've got an automated message that is personalized from Dr. Berg, who's welcoming you to her course. Um, she's giving you information about how to be successful. She's reminding you about the online tutoring that's available to students 24 seven. Maybe she's pointed out some LinkedIn learning uh, videos as supplemental content that uh, could be a prerequisite um, for the course is like, you know, if you need more information, here's that. So it looks like Dr. Berg sat down and typed the student a very detailed, you know, uh, email that took her 20 minutes to send to each student, but it's all automated. It's got the student's first name in it, it's very personalized. It's sent at a very particular time once a condition is met. Um, but she types it one time and she's got it the entire semester and you could copy these from course to course. So you could have one message that you kind of use throughout several courses. Um, one thing that we like to do with this, the FedEx Institute or the, the FedEx Prep Academy is that we like to congratulate students on completing work. Now that's a little bit unique of a scenario because these are students who have never been to college or they've been out of college for you know, uh, uh, many years and we're trying to just congratulate them as they go to keep them engaged. Um, so when they complete a particular module, in this case, it's a, a, it's a knowledge check or a quiz, you can congratulate the student you know, well done on completing, you know, quiz one that covered X, Y, Z, you know, log back in and go ahead and get started on the second module. Um, so we try to remind students constantly that there is an end goal in mind. You know, we want to get them in the University of Memphis. We want to get them a bachelor's degree. In our congratulations messages, we also remind them what the industry average for a bachelor's degree is in Memphis, Tennessee area. So it's like, you know, right now you, you don't have this, but if you do, this is what the industry average, which you could make by completing your degree. Um, so it kind of helps constantly keep students engaged by, you know, getting them a wall back in and continuing their work. We can also send students with low scores. So just like we create a release condition that a certain threshold had to be met, you can also do a minimum. So let's say they made below a 70 or below an 80, whatever the threshold you want it to be. You know, maybe you're sending them LinkedIn learning courses uh, or videos um, or supplemental readings. Um, and some of the courses I teach, it's very IT heavy. Uh, so if a student is not familiar with HTML or maybe PHP or some type of language uh, that requires a prerequisite, um, I could have an intelligent agent to send them a link, say, hey, I noticed you scored a little low on this assessment. Check out this LinkedIn learning course on you know, how to use PHP that would kind of help you be successful in this course. And so even though they were supposed to kind of already have that skill set coming into my course, I'm providing them some supplemental information to kind of remind them or refresh their memory on some of those required elements. Um, you can also contact students who are not accessing the course. And this is probably one of the most beneficial uses of it because we all have students who, for whatever reason, just drop off. Uh, they're not logging in, they're not staying engaged. Um, there's you know, numerous reasons, especially now, you know, due to COVID, but the intelligent agent can send them an email if they haven't logged in within seven days or 10 days. You, can, you set the login period threshold, um, and then you can remind them that, um, you know, one of the things that I did is I set up a Google voice number. Um, it's totally free, uh, voice.google.com if you're not familiar with it. And what happens is you get a personalized number that you can then share with your students. And I just share that number and have students text me. Um, I was amazed by how many students would text before they'd email. And I always remind students, you know, text is more for informal conversation, question on assignments, but it's anything related to grades or anything like that. We do have to keep it uh, through email for FERPA. Uh, but if students are not accessing courses, you know, you feel comfortable, give them your phone number to reach out or remind them to email you directly to schedule a virtual cons uh, consultation via virtual classroom or Zoom. So just some ways you can use um, intelligent agents. And that last point there, it really is set and forget. You set it, it runs itself. Um, so just for a second time, end of your course or all the, all the fun stuff lives. Uh, intelligent agents will be at the bottom under communication. And then you just click new, give it a name. And then here's, and it has a really simple UI. 
it asks you, do you want to use all users or just user specific role? I recommend all users. All users are going to be students in most of our courses anyway. And then here's that login activity, course activity, and then you have the release conditions down at the bottom. And then here's where you start customizing um, you know, everything that you can do. It, now, it does, now, the one downside, I will say this, is that it can only go to their eCourseWare email. Um, so you won't be able to email them at memphis.edu, but they will get a notification in eCourseWare. If they have an email message, if they have an alert there. Um, so if you're actively using eCourseWare as your primary email system for your students, this would be great. If you've told students to email you directly at memphis.edu, um, then this may be a downside of that because unfortunately those two do not connect currently. But you'll see here where it's, uh, you know, you have the same WYSIWYG editor, the message editor there that you can format your text, include links, include links from your course, include external links, you know, whatever you want to include there. And you also have the ability uh, down here to drop files in. Um, you may have heard about video note as well. You can record a video note here. It's a really short video. Um, there's nothing to download or install. You can record yourself right within the message. And then here's where you run that schedule. So you can run it daily to where, you know, every day it's looking to see is that condition met. It's looking to see how many students have completed the syllabus quiz, how many students have completed X, Y, Z. Um, so you can have it set to repeat. Now, something like a syllabus quiz and you want to send a welcome message, you may want to run that daily, but only run it for really the first two weeks of the course. Because after the first two weeks, hopefully everybody's taking a syllabus quiz and they're logged in. Um, so you could put a start and, and end date on that as well. Scott, someone was asking about um, creating a sandbox course in eCourseWare. Is there a way that they can request having something like that set up? There is, yeah. And so um, I can, we can send you the link to request a, a master course uh, to be created or a developmental course. Um, it is through the um, help desk portal. So uh, that is actually handled by our friends over at Center for Teaching and Learning, which uh, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, but they actually create the master course and they can assign. Um, and I'll send you the link here just in a second for that. Um, but you can put a request in for that and they'll, they'll definitely, and that's a great, um, that is a great question because I would recommend, um, especially some of these more um, higher end tools like intelligent agents where you've got to do a little bit of setup work to get it running. I would recommend doing it and testing it in your master course um, instead of a live course. You can definitely do it in a live course. Um, and then if you want to send one to students, just let them know that this is a test. But um, once you've done one, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty simple to, uh, to copy and do the other one. So there is the, sorry, that is a long URL, but that is the direct link to request a developmental shell from my team. Um, and then perfect timing. Speaking of practice, there is a practice run that you can run. So once you create the intelligence agent, if you just want to run a practice to see who's identified, what it looks like to the student, you can run a practice run before it actually runs the intelligence agent to the student. So that is one way if you wanted to put it in your live course to be able to test as well. So we'll pause here just for uh, a minute or two. Um, if we had any more questions, I'm happy to address those about intelligent agents. Um, we also can link you uh, some documentation and chat about a little bit more information from D2L on intelligent agents. Um, they have Desire to Learn, which uh, for those who are not familiar, they have some um, great documentation on how to use the system. Um, matter of fact, this video I'm about to post is probably the best. Um, I'm a visual learner. Uh, first, I like, I like short videos instead of a couple page PDF article. So this is a great three minute video on how to set that up um, and kind of goes over everything we just talked about in the PowerPoint. So I just linked that's the YouTube link uh, in chat. Using to you feel quit talking back to me. There you go. All right, close that tab. All right, so um, last but not least, um, my personal favorite, again, I kind of teased the um, gamification and night series we have. So if you want to uh, hear us geek out for about an hour, an hour and a half on gamification, feel free to attend that. But for the, the brief little five minute segment about gamification, um, you can really try to uh, increase engagement um, within your course by just gamifying it. Um, 
You also want students to enjoy the process of learning. Um, and this enjoyment, you know, can be uh, different avenues for different people. But if they absorb the information in a fun and entertaining way, they're most likely to continue through the entire course. We're really trying to increase that engagement, increase that login activity. Uh, they want to engage with the resources and further potential for success in leveraging the knowledge that they're gleaning from your course. Uh, so from some studies that we've done, um, my own dissertation I did on faculty engagement for professional development. I had a, a about 20 faculty that were part of my study. And I found personally that it did increase engagement. Um, different studies have showed different results, but for the most part, um, gamification is directly tied um, to that um, engagement rate of getting them to log in more, getting them to um, have some type of attainable uh, goal within the course and something they can like tangibly see. They can issue a certificate, a badge, um, and so, if you want to go through the, um, the presentation, here's got some good information from Talent LMS about a study they did about learners' preferences on uh, gamification. Um, and so I just want to kind of show you the fun stuff here. So here's uh, inside edit course, same place that we found intelligent agents earlier. You'll also find um, awards. So that's what the gamification tool is called as awards. Um, and you can see here, here's some that we created for the Summer Institute. Uh, we work with marketing to get some nice little, uh, some icons created. Uh, you can also send them a marketing request. They'll be happy to do that as well. Uh, if you go to marketing's website, there is a link to submit a marketing request and you can just tell them that, hey, I'm wanting some digital badges for my course. Uh, you can give them the name of the course. Uh, if your college has got a logo on file and they can incorporate the college's logo. Uh, but in this case, we had ba uh, badges related to the three main units in our Summer Institute, which was uh, design, develop, and delivery, uh, which goes well with our, our department's name. But the released condition for this was based on knowledge checks that were required within each module. Again, going back to those release conditions we talked about earlier, in order to progress through each module, you have a release condition. You can also use that same release condition to now provide the students something tangible that they can see. In this case, it's a digital badge. Uh, and this digital badge can be you know, exported outside of eCourseWare, it can be shared on LinkedIn profiles, it can be put on digital portfolios. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with creating and designing these. Um, and you can also, um, so that last slide did not get added, but there is a certificate that you can show. Um, and we've got just a few minutes here. I'm gonna go ahead and just show you what that looks like within the Summer Institute. Let me move my, can everybody still see my screen okay? I sh you should be able to see uh, eCourseWare now. Fair, is that coming across on your side? Of? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect, thanks. All right, so again, edit course, uh, what we talked about earlier, um, you do have to be faculty, which all of you should be faculty in your course. Uh, to be able to see that. So if you go to edit course, and underneath assessments is where you'll find awards. And I need to actually be in this faculty. Hold on once, I'll forget. We've got, uh, we've got admin accounts, but admin accounts don't like all the tools. So let me impersonate a faculty member really quick. and. Bear with me just one second. All right, fair, I'm impersonating you. Okay, so now I'm logged in as fair. So I won't go fair, this is fair's course. Um, she's gone in, she's created some awards. And now I can see all the awards that's been issued to all the participants. In this case, this was the Summer Institute. Um, so I don't think Rebecca Lamanda is showing hers. I click on, this tells the student exactly what they did to receive it. And so here's the condition that was applied to get it. Um, on their end, they have the ability to generate the certificate and see it. I, as a faculty member, have the ability to see it as well. And then that's what it looks like. The system automatically, uh, when you create the PDF, it automatically has the ability to put their name in. 
Um, in this case, we had Dr. Neenan's signature in as provost and then mine. Um, but basically we just had a, a certificate that was created in Adobe and marketing created this for us. I just put in the replace strings. Uh, but once you create one, it's super easy to go through and create multiple. Um, and then it really is simple, just clicking add a word to the course. And then there already have can, can ones that you can use, uh, or you can actually just create your own, give it a name. And then you all down here at the bottom, um, you have the ability to upload your icon, uh, or you can choose one of the, the ones that are already built in the system automatically for you. Um, and that's pretty much it. Once you create it, then you could, you have the ability, um, within the system to set up the, how it's met. And so in this case, um, the delivery for mastery was completing the survey. So we wanna make sure we get uh, survey responses from the faculty before they got the badge and submitting to a certain Dropbox folder. So once they've done that, they automatically get issued that badge and it's available to them within the awards uh, automatically within the course. So again, if you wanna learn more information about that, we're doing an in-depth Ignite um, coming up next month. Uh, you can register for that on our website and then um, we'll, we'll go over kind of how to create those and, and kind of some best practices of applying. But just to kind of a quick overview is, um, that is available to you. When you create that master course or request one to be created for you, you know, feel free to play around there. That's a great place to you know, create some awards, create some badges, see how, um, see how the, um, the system sets them up, you know, how you can play around different icons. And once you get one that you like, then you know, once you get ready to teach the, that course for the new term or, or even existing term, you can just copy those badges and certificates over and they'll be available in your live course as well. So that wraps up our slides for this. I've got just a few minutes. We'll pause here. We're happy to stay on and answer any questions. I know we're right at we'll be respectful of our nice time. We're at the clock mark, but uh, we'll be happy to stay on and answer questions. Thank you. I do know that there are going to be people that are interested in video assignments in eCourseWare. Sure. I don't know how much time that would take to demonstrate. Yeah, so we can. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here again. That's uh, something we can definitely demonstrate here. Um, so under content in eCourse, uh, any module that you have, you have the ability to add existing activities. Back to my monitor. Um, add existing activities in the video summit is going to be on the drop down list. Um, the video summit really allows you to create um, engagement content that um, you can do as an individual project, you can do as a group project. Um, you have the ability to do question and answers as well as interactive video. Um, and so the most common case that we find for these will just be interactive videos, which is one that you can easily set up. Um, an interactive video is where you just give it a name and then you can give it a due date. And then here's where you can actually record yourself. So I could click um, recording camera or just screen. So if I want to be able to do both, I can click record video. It's going to activate um, one of my webcams, which is on my laptop here. And then I have the ability to you know, share my screen if I wanted to. And I can actually share my screen and then give them instructions exactly what I want them to do. So I can verbally give it and then I can also uh, record uh, myself uh, on the screen as well as on the video, giving them instructions for uh, that presentation. And then I'm just going to stop here. So it saves it. And then um, your instructions, the text is also required. So I can just put here like watch video for instructions. And then the interactive piece is where you can actually upload a video. So it could be MP4. Um, it can be you know, some type of video you recorded previously, um, or you can also record yourself um, from recording video. So you've got the same features that you have from the instructions. I can record myself giving a lecture. I can share my screen, all that good stuff. And then you have the ability to um, add the questions. So let me just record a quick couple of seconds here. So it'll give me the question ability. So it's a test one, two, three, four. I'm gonna stop, save. 
So depending on your internet connection, it takes a second for it to upload. So that was only four seconds. So hopefully that won't take too long. Um, AT&T has been a little wonky over at my house lately. So hopefully it won't take too long for it to upload. But once you get it uploaded, basically the questions, what you do is you tie it to a particular timestamp. We've all taken those uh, HR trainings uh, required where you watch a video and you can't skip ahead and <laughs> you have to be paying attention. Uh, this is, uses very similar technology. And so once your video is uploaded, um, you can then pick where in the video you want to um, you know, ask them a question. What's great about this uh, particular tool is you can also set it to do video response for the student. So they can answer a multiple choice question or you can have them requ um, require them to respond back with their own video or audio. Uh, we recently started using this in the medical transcription course to where um, students are having to hear and uh, do role, case, uh, role play scenarios. They're hearing a doctor talk to a patient, uh, the doctor speaking English to a, span to, to a patient who speaks Spanish and the student is having to, tra to translate what is going on in that conversation. So that's a great situation where they upload a video, the role play scenario, they stop it at a certain segment, and then they have the student respond in Spanish and the instructor can grade them on that. So you'll see here, you know, only four second video, but I'll hit create a question. And then here's where I have the multiple choice or video response. So if I wanna do a video response and I wanna prompt them at, in this case, it would be like two seconds or I can set it to just the very end of the video and then um, res respond with your feedback. Again, you could give it, you notice here it has up to 2000 characters. So you can give a very detailed question, but for this case, we'll just do a short one. And then that's it. Um, the question's automatically added. I put it at the end of the video. You can give it a timestamp as well. And then here's where you choose your grading. You can do percentage, rubric, pass, fail, auto pass, five stars all that good stuff. I'll throw in chat um, here in just a second, documentation from the vendor. Um, Bongo, who D2L partnered with, they have great documentation, very short um, chunk content to show you all the different settings for grading, as well as setting up all these different, um, different options. Uh, real quickly too, peer review, you can have the system automatically select peers to review the video or you can actually select them from the class list if you want to manually assign a peer review. Um, so this is a great way, um, Fair talked about it earlier, beginning the presentation, trying to get, um, one way to increase engagement is getting other students involved within the assignments. So maybe this isn't a graded assignment, you just want it to be peer reviewed. You're not necessarily looking at it as much as the students are. Uh, so that's one way you can do that. And you can allow peer review before submission as well. So if it was, um, for instance, the assignment was a job interview, a mock job interview. You had a couple of questions to ask. Maybe you want the students to review each other's submissions before they submit it to you for a formal assessment. The bill that has the ability to do that. Other option too, this was um, good news to our law school when I presented to them. Um, by ABA, the American Bar Association requires that um, students' identity is uh, anonymous when they're reviewing assignments. And so the system automatically has that ability too. So if you wanted the, the student to be anonymous or the peer review to be anonymous, there is the ability for that. So it basically uh, hides the student's name once they're either grading or peer reviewing it. And then you can select the number of peer reviews, all that good stuff there. Uh, the other option too, um, and I'll send in documentation for this, um, is you can also have a text analysis, which is a really neat tool. So you can do the individual project option um, and then you can tell the system to search for keywords. So if you, if you um, were talking about a certain topic and you wanted them to you know, talk about uh, that topic within you know, three to five minutes time frame, you can tell the system to look for X amount of keywords and you tell the system what keywords are that you're looking for. And it will, it will scan the transcript and then let you know exactly how many times that word came up um, and if they use a lot of filler words like ums or these, or if they went silent for a period of time, it does a automatic text analysis of that as well. So I'm gonna throw some documentation in chat for a little more information about that. We also have uh, a webinar that we did through the Summer Institute where we went really in depth with video assignments in the virtual classroom. I'll also will link that um, documentation or that webinar link in chat as well. 
So any, I know that was kind of quick, but any questions in general about any one of those tools? Well, you're very skilled. It makes it look like somebody that knows how to tie shoes. <laughs> it's just automatic like that. Thank you. That's helpful. Of course. Yeah. Like I said, we're happy to follow up. Um, and Chad, I'm also putting human 3D at Memphis. Pretty easy to there. Um, that's the email that goes to the entire group. So you okay. can do consultations. I'm available directly. We also have some really talented chef on our team too. To do that. Now, I'm going to ask the last thing link I'll talk about the Summer Institute in really detail about both of those tools. So, if you want to learn more about uh, video assignments um, as well as virtual classroom, uh, those are available there as well. Well, thank you. I don't know if there are other questions. I, I know. We're going a little over, and I want to be respectful of your time, too. But this has been very helpful, Scott and Fair. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Oh, anytime. I'll probably be asking you to come back again. Hi, <laughs> definitely send us an email. Thank you. Well, we hope it was for everybody. Again, you've, you've got the links. Um, yes. One thing too, uh, you're probably familiar with this, but when you go to the recording, you have the ability to export the text file for the chat as well. Um, that may be beneficial for uh, I've had. We're also happy to put in these uh, links. In the okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, Unless there are any other questions, I, I appreciate it. And like I said, I'll, I'll be looking at it. I'll, I'm going to watch it again, and then I look at the questions that I had and see whether or not there's anything else that uh, I can have you come back and provide. Sounds good. Yeah, we're, we're happy, to, happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. All right. Enjoy the rest Thanks. of your uh, yeah. Have a great holiday weekend. You too. Thank you. Good weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.